thankful to be here today to be saved and born again in the blood of Christ. Amen. If you want to, you can uh, remain standing because we're going to get right into the scriptures here this morning. Let's open up our Bibles to 1 Peter in chapter 2. 1 Peter in chapter 2. And uh, we're going to be in the latter part of the chapter. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning and have the liberty and the honor and privilege to come and worship him in spirit and in truth. I ask you guys to please continue to pray, if you will, for our surrounding area, uh, for Aber Ammon, uh, Abadair, all the surrounding communities and villages. Guys, listen, uh, I love history. I love history probably more than most people. But you know what? It's time for us to make our own history. Amen. You know, if the Lord tarries his coming another hundred years, I want my grandchildren reading about what happened there in Abadea, what happened in Sarah, what, what bled out throughout the, the, the valleys of South Wales from right here, amen. Uh, you know, I, I love reading about what happened in 1904, 1905, in the latter 1700s, in the mid-18s. I love reading all that stuff. Don't get me wrong, but it's time for us to make our own history. So let's ask God to move in a great and special way right here in our, our home church and go out throughout the valley so that we may see souls saved, lives put back together, and families put in order. Amen. First Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, look with me in verse 20. The Bible says, For what glory is it? If when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even here unto were ye called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness, by whose stripes you are here, you were healed. Verse 25 says, for, for ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, again for the opportunity to be here. Father, bless us now, meet with us now. Guide us by thy loving hand and thy perfect word, that we may live for you even more. Father, we do pray for our surrounding village here. We pray, dear God, that the words that are spoken this morning would, would bleed out into the city, out into the town, out into the streets, dear God, into the homes. Souls may be here, may be convicted, and willfully, Lord God, take hold of thy sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. So, Lord, we come before you today. We come before you as thy servants and ask that you move in a great way in our lives. We give you all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory. We ask these things in the precious name of thy Son, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. Please be seated. What a blessing it is to be here again today. <clears throat> my wife always says it's a danger for me to wear my glasses because I'm always fooling with them. That's one of the reasons I went to, to wear contacts. When Jason asked me today if I had any contacts left, and I ran out of uh, this this material called bleak and cleans. I've been using saline to, uh, to moisten my eyes in the morning. It just doesn't clean them. So I took them out on, a, I believe it was Friday or something or Thursday night, and I've had them cleaning in the little, the little capsule thing. So I have my glasses on today. So please forgive me if I tend to grab a hold of them. I honestly do not notice it. Uh, you know, my wife notices. She goes, you got to leave your glasses alone. And, um, so anyway, I, I do I do ask you to forgive me in advance because more than likely I will grab a hold of them and Lord willing, I won't lose them in doing so. The Bible says in the last verse there, verse 25, I'm just going to give you this by way of introduction. He says, For ye were as a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. When the Lord Jesus Christ looked out across Jerusalem during his earthly ministry and the Bible says that he had wept. He wept for a multitude of reasons, but when he looked out at his own people that he came to, to be a, a savior to, when he looked out upon Israel, when he looked out upon them and, and saw their souls, he looked at them and he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. 
Now, we know a lot about sheep in this country. They're everywhere. We see them on the hills. We see them on the road. We see them in the ditches. We see them all over. And a sheep will go. They will just wonder and wonder and wonder. Uh, you have to fence them in. If you don't fence them in, they'll just continue to wonder. And wherever the grass is, they'll go and they'll eat the grass. And that's the way sheep are. That's just the way they are. And that's what the Lord is liking us unto. He didn't liken us into a, a mighty lion. He didn't like us, us, like us into a courageous tiger. He didn't say that we were strength and bear. He said we were like sheep gone astray. We were His creation. We are God's, God's creation that was brought into this world to bring Him glory. But we lost our ability to do that when man fell in the Garden of Eden. Beloved, our text this morning, our text verse will be verse 24. And as the Apostle Peter wrote, being moved by the Holy Spirit of God, uh, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, testimony that he puts down there, who lashed out, uh, not, uh, he lashed not out of them that reviled him. He did not threaten back in this when he suffered. He did not, uh, when, when he was buffeted for that cause, when all the things that Jesus Christ suffered at the hands of man because of us, he didn't retaliate. It will be easy this morning to sit here and preach a message uh, about, uh, about how Jesus Christ didn't lash out and how you shouldn't lash out and, and, and the character, the characteristics of each and every Christian. And, and be honest with you, I wrestled with what the Lord would have me to preach today. Uh, I'll share with, uh, with, with Sister Daisy yesterday. I said, pray for me. I said, I, I'm in the middle between a, a preaching. I, I'm in a quandary, if you will, of preaching two messages. I had one that I wanted to preach that was strictly for the Christian. It was uh, about Christian living. And, and I lost that peace to preach that message yesterday afternoon. And, and God opened up the door here in 1 Peter chapter 2. And so much as we begin to look and we need to understand that it will be easy for us to come in here and say, don't retaliate when someone hits you. Don't retaliate when someone says something evil of you. Don't, don't lash back out because Jesus Christ did. And that would be a great message of the day. Maybe we'll cover that sometime. But I want you to notice with me first and foremost this morning. I want you to look at our text verse of verse 24 and understand that there is a problem. Verse 24 mentions our sins. This is the problem, my friend. This is the problem that this world possesses. This is the problem that this world has. This is the problem that you and I have this morning. That it is our sins. Now, we, I could sit here and I could, I could elaborate on the fact of sins and I could say, well, your sins affect me and my sins affect you. And that is true. But at the end of the day, it is our sins that become the problem. On 11 April 1970, a spacecraft was launched from Kennedy Space Center in, in uh, the United States in a state where I grew up in called Florida. It would be the seventh manned mission of the American Apollo Space Program with a mission to explore the highlands there on the moon. Now many of you guys know the story of Apollo 13. This mission to go to the moon, this mission to land on the moon would be aborted by a, an oxygen tank that would rupture, uh, that would explode, and it crippled the service module of the spacecraft, which crippled the command module that it depended on. They would, they, these astronauts would exist with limited oxygen, Shortage of potable water. Uh, they had a loss of cabin heat, decreased power, and they had a jerry-rigged uh, carbon dioxide removal system on there. And on 2109 hours on the 13th of April, when the oxygen tank exploded and a warning light illuminated, astronaut Jack Swigger said this across the NASA radio program, and the world heard it all over. It says, Houston, we've had a problem. Now we understand that the Hollywood has changed that to, to, to Houston. We have a we have a problem. But what Jack said was, Houston, we've had a problem. And beloved, I'm here to tell you this morning that 45 years later, Houston, we have a problem. There was a call that went out into all mankind. 
mankind some 6,000 years ago uh, more, more devastating than that which occurred uh, in space that day with an oxygen tank exploding. There was a call that went out much like that one that day where Jack said, Houston, we've had a problem with this call without saying this. Mankind or world or all future generations, we, uh, we've made a problem. The problem is our sins, beloved. Our sins began when only two people existed on the planet. Earth was beautiful. It was a perfect environment. The liberals can tell us all day long and, and the environment, listen, I'm all for saving. Uh, I, listen, I don't like littering. I don't want to do this and that. Uh, but if I think, if we think today that a cattle farm in Nebraska, the methane gas is blowing a hole in the ozone, we're fooling ourselves, amen? It was funny, I think God plays tricks on those people. All the billions of dollars that, that America spent on trying to fix the ozone layer and trying to fix these things, all of a sudden they found out that it moved, amen? And it works just like a greenhouse does. Releasing gas and releasing heat for the furtherance of God's creation. God knows what he's doing. I don't believe we ought to litter. I, don't, I really don't believe that. It, it makes me sick. I, the last piece of gum that I think I threw out of a window was in 1998. You say, I didn't know that because that's when I met my wife, amen? And I threw a piece of gum out the window, and buddy, she let me have it. And you say, well, why? why? Well, because she didn't want her, uh, somebody's car to run over and get gum all over their, their vehicle. I said, well, that's mighty nice. The world was a perfect environment. Everything was beautiful. It was a perfect place for people to live. I mean, the ground was lush, allowing all types of growth to occur, and, but yet in that same perfect environment, in that same garden, is where our sins began. Adam was given a commandment in Genesis chapter 2. Verses 16 and 17 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of knowledge of, of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. This commandment, as you know, was broken. It was broken, it was unkept, if you will, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, where Eve had taken to the fruit and gave to her husband that was with her. He wasn't off working, and he wasn't off naming the animals, he wasn't off doing something uh, noble. He was standing right there and allowed uh, the devil to, to beguile her, to deceive her, and therefore he was in the transgression. Notice with me what transpired that day allows us to understand that today we have a problem. Romans chapter 5, you can read it from up top. Verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. In verse 17, the first part of it says, For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Notice with me this morning the problem of sin. There are two types of sins that mankind are guilty of, both of which occurred in the Garden of Eden that day. There is what we call the sins of commission, which means uh, uh, the sins that, that you actively commit, the things that you, you do. Uh, but the Bible says, for by one man's, one man's sin, I mean, one man's offense, death reigned by all. Adam committed a sin by taking the fruit that he was openly told not to do so. He openly disregarded the commandment of God, and that is what God calls sin. Sin is an offense unto God. Now we sin against ourselves in many ways. We sin against our family in many ways. We sin against our own nation in many ways. We sin against uh, our last name in many ways. But sin is an offense primarily to God. In Psalm 51 verse 4, David's clearly said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned. David sinned against Israel. David sinned against Uriah. David sinned against Bathsheba. David sinned against his own family. But when the eyes of God is upon it. When you look at what a sin is, it's an offense to God. The Bible defines sin in 1 John 3, 4. It defines it as a transgression of the law, the law of God. So therefore, when we commit a crime against the law of God, we therefore sin. So the, the sins of commission we commit, which is an offense to God. Secondly, we know that there are sins of omission, which means that we just simply don't do what we should do. Amen. Adam was given an opportunity to obey God. 
But he chose to disobey. Thus his lack of disobedience. I'm sorry. His lack of obedience. Became a sin of omission. Herein lies the problem. You say, Preacher, what is the problem today? Our sins. It's our problem. Sins of commission, the things we actively commit. Sins of commission, the things we simply omit and obey of God. This is why we are in the state that we are in today in the world. Because of our sins. You know what sin does? It robs us of communion with God. Can you think right now of something in your life, something that you've done, said, whatever it may be, that's coming between you and someone that is very dear to you? Maybe nothing that you did, maybe it was something they did. <clears throat> It drove a wedge between you two. And as bad as that may seem today, it is our sins form a wedge between us and God. A wedge between us and God is worse than anything we can do to anyone on this earth because it is the glorification of the Lord himself is why we are on this earth. And it is that sin, that transgression of his law, it is, ex it is that sin that occurred in the garden that is passed down throughout the genetic code in the bloodline of mankind that is our problem today. The astronaut said, Houston, we've had a problem. The Bible screams out in many ways Mankind, we've made a problem. So not only do we see in our text verse this morning our problem. By the way, it's personal. Amen. The second thing we see in our text is we see the person. Verse 24 there, it says, Who his own self bear our sins. For there is one person that could pay the price for the sin of mankind. Only one. I couldn't do it. Brother Jason can't do it. Darius can't do it. Only one that could pay the price for the sin of mankind. There was only one man that Peter depicts him in the previous verse. If you look up in verse 21, where he says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his step, who did no sin. Neither was God found in his mouth. You see, the 22nd verse sums up the life of Christ who did no sin. The Bible tells us, uh, the Bible states that for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This person, Jesus the Christ, was perfect in all manners. He was guiltless. He was sinless. He was guileless. It says neither was guile found in his mouth. The word guile means deceit. It means beguile, to be beguiled. We know that Satan beguiled Eve. There's no deceit. There is no self-gain. There is no covetousness found in the Lord Jesus Christ. No lust, no anything of that mind. Found in him, his ways were perfect. He was tempted in all manners as we are. And not one time did he fall. Not one time did he fail. People say, well, do you think that, do you think he ever considered? I said, I don't even think he ever considered a sin. Any of them. No thought. Found perfect, without fault. Why? Because he wanted to die a death that we owe. Houston, there's a problem. Not only in our text do we find that there's a problem, which is our sins, but there's a person, uh, which is our salvation, but we also find a place. Look at verse 24 again. He says, on the tree. There's a designated place where our sins, which is our problems, was paid for. It's, it's a place that is called Golgotha, the place of the skull in Matthew 27, verse 33. 
The only time in the Bible, Luke 23, 33, we find that it's a place called Calvary. We find in the Old Testament, as prophesied Genesis 22, 2, it's a place called Mount Moriah, the very place where Abraham took the, the, the lad, the, the, took his son uh, Isaac up onto the mountain to, to sacrifice him, to prove unto God there was nothing between him and, and his Lord. All of these places are referred to the same location where the greatest tragedy, yet this greatest gift, would take place in A.D. 30. It was this place that was outside the city, the picture of being taken outside of the camp uh, from the Old Testament law, where the perfect sinless vessel would be offered for the sin of mankind. In stark contrast, if you will, in stark contrast to the initiation of sin in the world, that of the sin of commission, and that of sin of omission, we find that commission is an offense against God. Omission is the disobedience of God or just uh, doing nothing at all. Jesus Christ would commit nothing wrong, but commit his life unto the Father to fully atone for our sins in this world. Jesus Christ himself would be completely obedient, therefore not committing the sin of omission. Jesus Christ would be uh, completely uh, willing to offer his life, therefore not being an offense unto the Father, so that our price could be paid. What was the problem? The problem was our sins, not his. But who's the person? Jesus Christ. But there was a designated place for he had made him to be sin. For us who knew no sin. This place, the Bible calls it a tree. Why do you think it's called a tree? I mean, why this place? What, 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 couldn't it just have been anywhere because he was sinless, amen? He was perfect. I mean, as long as he paid the price for our sin, couldn't it just have been, couldn't have been in the judgment hall? Galatians chapter 3, and we read it from the top, verse 13. The Bible says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. In the 21st chapter, in and around verse 22 in the book of Deuteronomy, the law was given that if a man commit a sin worthy of death, that he should be hanged on a tree. It was that it was considered to be the ultimate price for committing the ultimate crime. This place was prophesied. Not only the location, the Mount Moriah, being Jerusalem, being outside the city, but the very place on a tree, he who committed no sin, he who had no guile in his life, he who had no sin whatsoever in all of his being, would become sin by dying. For the transgressions of the world. Houston, we have a problem. Mankind, we've made a problem. Not only do we find in this text that, that we find the problem of our sins, we find the, the person of salvation, we find the place of substitution, but we also find this morning, we find the power, if you will. Look in verse 24 again, and he says, should live unto righteousness. Notice that. Brother, can I submit this thought to you this morning? You cannot do it yourself. You can't. You cannot live righteous in this life. There is not an amount of, there is not an amount of money in all of the world that would convince you to live righteous. You said, why? Because it's not in your nature to do so. Man, you can be good. You can probably be honest. You can be moral. You don't, you don't necessarily have to be a vagabond. You don't necessarily have to be a, a murderer. You don't have to be a, a, a thief. You don't have to be all those things, but you're still not going to be righteous. You're not going to be righteous apart from Christ. The book of Isaiah tells us in the 64th chapter in verse 6, but we are as we are all as an unclean thing. And, and all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. What have our iniquities taken us away from? Taken us away from the communion with God. Oh, Houston, we got a problem. 
Mankind, we got, we've made a problem. What is it? Because we were away from God. But there was a glorious, glorious Son of God who came down here, who, who was the person of salvation, a place of substitution. Why? To give us the power that we should live unto righteousness. I don't have the verse up there, but I'll quote it to you. But the Bible tells me that man at his best state is altogether what? Vanity. The best we have to offer is vanity. Isaiah says that, 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 that our righteousness is as a filthy rag. What does that mean? A filthy rag was, was the rags that were used to wrap up the leprous person. And what they would do is they would take the, these rags and they would unwrap them. And I know this is going to be a little bit disgusting. And I realize we're probably close to lunch and tea time. But nevertheless, just bear with me, if you will. Amen? <laughs> I'll come up with something. It's, it's, the, it's the disgusting diet. I'll talk about this and you say, I won't eat. Amen. But they would unravel the leprous arm or the leprous body part to where the, uh, the fluid, the leprous fluid, the pus, if you will, soaked into that fabric and got caught up into the fibers and they would unravel it away. And what was it to be done? The filthy rags were to be taken and cast away and burned. Amen. The best you and I have to offer in our life today, the best that you and I can do apart from Jesus Christ is no better than a leprous filled, infection, pus filled rag that is taken off and cast and be burned and thrown away. The best we have to offer is that of vanity apart from the Lord Savior. It is through the precious gift of the precious gift that hanged on a tree that day in a place called Calvary. The person who paid for our property. Man, have you ever heard somebody, and, and, and I'm being, uh, they'll see someone, you know, acting, like, acting out of fit or whatever, and they say, what's your problem? You ever see, if somebody probably may have asked you that one time, you got up on the wrong side of the bed, and, and, and your wife or your husband or your friend at school or wherever it may be, they've said, what's your problem? You know, I, they said, you get up on the wrong side of the bed. You ever been asked that before? I've been asked that before. What I, I make a joke sometimes. I say, hey, do you need to go back to bed? And they say, why? I say, well, you get back up on the right side. Amen. It's our problem. It's our sins. The person in a place can give us the power to live righteous today. He did that on the cross of Calvary person who paid for our sins, our price, that we may have access to that power. This world is power hungry, driven by power, financial power, fiscal power in the business world. That's what they're looking for. Men want, they want to be fueled by power. They want a car that has, you know, 11,000 uh, 11, horsepower. They go from zero to 60 in, in a, a second and a half. And they, you, they want that power. Like you can go anywhere in this country that fast without even getting caught on a camera or going through a roundabout, amen. I don't know why we, we want a Lamborghini. It's a quarter of a million pound car. It goes zero to 60 in two and a half seconds. For what? <laughs> You're, there's nowhere you can go, amen. People want power, but God gave us power to live righteous for him. He did that in a place called Calvary. He did it in a place on the tree. He's the only person in this world that can do it because he is the only one righteous enough because it was our problem, not his. You ever think of it like that? Jesus Christ was sitting on the throne in all eternity. Robes of eternal God. He willingly stepped down off of that, off of that eternal ram and wrapped all the robes of flesh making him subject to sickness, making him subject to, to hot and to cold and to wet and to dry, making him subject to hunger. To pay a price for people was their problem. Not only did we find in our text this morning the problem of our sins, the person of salvation, place of substitution, we find the power of sanctification. I mean, let, me, let me interject one thing here. I'll borrow one minute. This is free, by the way. This doesn't cost you any extra. Amen. 
I was going to preach a message around this thought, and uh, I don't know if it will or not. Speaking of this power of sanctification, speaking of this, of this, you know, the Bible says that, that, that if, if, if anyone's in Christ, behold, that all things become new. That we're a new creature, right? Things are new. The Bible tells us also to put off the old man, put on the new man, right? The Bible tells us also uh, to, to crucify the, the flesh, amen? The Bible says that we should, you know, crucify, we should mortify the old man with his deeds, amen? You know what deeds are? Works, activities, things that you do. That's what deeds are. People sit back and they say, well, preacher, that's just how I am. That's a lie that you bought. It's not how you are. It's how your nature is. It's how you're choosing to be. Because if you're here today and you're saved and born again, you've been given the power to live righteous before God in heaven today. You have that power. You say, well, that's just me. You say, well, preacher, I don't know. I'm just not there yet. Maybe you're not, and that's fine. But I'm trying to tell you, don't give up. Don't buy into the lie. You say, well, that's just me. That's the way I act. Uh, you know, the old world is drawing me back in. Listen, there comes a time if you've been saved for a length of period of time and serving God, that the old things of the world. They're disgusting to you. Paul talked about being ashamed of the things that you used to do. Amen. I so don't dig back down inside there. Don't go back into that world where that old man wants to go. That's where that flesh wants to go. Give the reins to the Holy Spirit of God. Let Him take your, your whole body, your mind, your soul. Let Live by His might. Amen. And don't say, that's just the way I am. No, sir. Say, that's the way God is and I'm going to live for Him. It's given you that power. You want power today. Forget the 1,100 horsepower car. Amen. Take the power of God. Amen. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Power of sanctification. But we have. We have all that. You know why we have that today? Do you know why we, we have the person on the cross? Do you know why our problems were paid for there? Do you know how we have the power of sanctification? Do you know how, how we have this, this precious gift that was given at a place of substitution? Because you and I have a pardon. You have a pardon. Look there in verse 24, the last part. It says, by whose stripes you are healed. That's a quote taken from the Directly from the 53rd chapter and the 5th verse of the book of Isaiah. 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 Amen. Get it right. When Isaiah wrote of the, of the, of the coming Messiah, do you know why so many people criticize the book of Isaiah? Isaiah. Hey, you got me mixed up trying to say it like that. But they reason they, they're so hypercritical of that book is because they can't understand it. You know why? They say it just seems like it's written by two, two different type of people. One man couldn't have written that book. They say, you know what? The, uh, the first 39 chapters of that book is written in one way. And the, the last 27 chapters of that book is written in another way. That can't be written by the same guy. I, last time I checked, putting those two numbers together, that's 66, amen. Kind of written like the whole Bible is. Those first 39 chapters is written like the Old Testament. Those latter 27 chapters is written like the New Testament. And it is in the, the, uh, the, first, uh, uh, um, the first section of that book, the first 39 that you find there, over there in, in, uh, in verse nine, chapter 9, that you find, unto us a child is born, amen. Then you have the ruling and reigning Messiah of, Acts, uh, of Isaiah chapter 9. But you get in Isaiah chapter 53, you find the suffering Messiah, where Paul quoted there, uh, verse, uh, verse 5 of chapter 53, he says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. No matter how you look at it, no matter how you break it down, God took that book of Isaiah and he gave us the prophecy of what was going to happen. And people couldn't rationalize that it was the same Messiah in Isaiah chapter 9 being the same Messiah in Isaiah 53. And one is Messiah ben, ben David, the ruling and reigning Messiah. The other one is Messiah ben Joseph, the, the suffering and shameful Messiah. And I submit to you this morning, this is the very same one. And one God, one man is the author of Isaiah and that is the Holy Spirit of God who moved upon the man Isaiah. He wrote all 66 books of that thing. All 66 chapters of that book. That's my God that wrote that thing. Amen. And that's where your faith has to be today. He's given us a pardon. He's given us a pardon that gave us the power uh, from a place of, of there and a person being Jesus Christ all because of our problem, not His. No matter how, no matter the magnitude of the transgression in our life, 
No matter what we have done or whom we have done it unto, through the precious blood of the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ atoned us for our sins. Houston, we have a problem, yes. Bless God this morning, we have a person. We have a person that went to a place that he could give us the power, and he did it all by the pardon of our sins. Our sins had to be atoned for. But can I tell you this, and we're done. It's got to be personal. It's got to be personal this morning. It's got to be personal and it's got to be simple today. The simplicity of Christ is found in that text verse of ours this morning. You're here today and you've been saved and born again in the blood of Christ. Praise the Lord for it. You did so by your own free will, by your choice, by accepting the atoning gift of Calvary. If you're here this morning and you're unsure of eternal salvation, can I tell you what he's doing? He's waiting for you to call upon him right now. He wants you to have that power. He wants you to have that pardon. Do you know what happens? We, we And this is not part of it. I'm just adding a little bit. We hold on to our past, don't we? We wear our past right here on our sleeves. We wear our feelings on our sleeves. We wear our past on our sleeves. We do that. I had a dear preacher friend of mine <clears throat> give me some advice a long time ago. It's one thing to accept the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and know that your sins are covered. It's another thing to accept the forgiveness that he has forgiven you. Mm -hmm. See, that's the problem, Houston. Jesus Christ has forgiven us for the sins. When, when we have accepted him and the free pardon of sin, those sins are forgotten. They are, they, are, they are removed as far as the east is from the west. But the problem lies when we don't accept the forgiveness of our forgiveness where we hold them and we wear them as a, as a robe, as a, almost sometimes people wear them as, as in a sense of false humility, or they wear them as, well, this is what I used to do. Guys, grab a hold of this morning what Jesus Christ did for you personally. It, it's a great cliche that preachers say that if I was the only one, he'd have still done it. And we hear it so many times, we, just, we let it come in one ear and out the other. But it's true today. Brother Mel, if he'd have been the only one on the face of this planet who took one cookie when he was 12 years old, therefore he committed a crime, if that was the only thing, the only one that needed Jesus Christ, he would have done everything that he went through for one soul. Just one. We say, what's the value of one? What's the value of a soul? What's the value of those astronauts in that capsule when that, when that oxygen tank exploded? What's the value of them? The same value of 7.2 billion today in this world. It's a personal price that Jesus Christ paid. Our sins were the problem. And his own body was the person It was on the tree. He that knew no sin became sin. That was the place so that we could live with his power. But it all happened because of his part. The Bible says, come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I submit to you this morning, beloved, title of this sermon at the very end. It is the crimson tide that covered our sins. It is the crimson tide that flowed down Calvary's mount 
It is the crimson tide that took our sins and our iniquity and covered it with his blood. You say, why? When God the Father, who cannot look upon iniquity, when God the Father, whose eyes are purer than our eyes, when He looks through the precious blood, pure blood of His Son, though your sins be as scarlet, He sees you white as snow. Will you bow your heads this morning? Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the wonderful gift that you've given us on the cross of Calvary. We thank you for the blessed time and opportunity that we've had in your house this morning. But I do come before you and I pray this morning. Lord, your word will be lifted up in our hearts. And Father, if every soul in this building this morning is truly saved and born again, your God, that you would let it be a constant reminder in our heart that you've given us the power to live for you in this world. That we'll forsake the things that in the past that we will allow the forgiveness that you've given us for eternity to dwell in our life in the temple. So Father, I pray that you go with your people today. Pray, dear Lord, that you keep our hearts focused on thee. That we may draw closer to the one that died for us, the person that went to that place because of our problem. We thank you this morning for the pardon and the power that came out. In Jesus' name, we ask these things.